Seventh grade lesson 13.3 is making predictions with theoretical probability. And we're gonna to learn to make a theoretical probability to use theoretical probability to make a quantitative prediction like for an, an, a value, a number. Uh, and then also use theoretical probability to make a qualitative prediction mostly like it's more likely that he's going to do this rather than that or it's more likely that this is going to happen rather than or less likely that this is going to happen you know something like that a comparison so that's really what those two break down to so let's go ahead and have a look at how we use theoretical probability to, to our advantage so the tool we want to dig out of the toolbox in our brain is our knowledge of equivalent fractions because we're going to be comparing two ratios and they're going to be equivalent to each other. So let's dig that out. That's the tool we use for reducing fractions um, and using proportions even too. So that's all going to come back at us too. So here's the first example they give us. You roll a standard number cube 150 times. Predict how many times you will roll a three or a four. So let's think about a number cube first of all. A number cube has six sides, so there's six possibilities of what you can roll. Out of those six possibilities, there's one three and there's one four. So those are the only two that we're talking about here, right? So there's only two chances that it's gonna be three or a four, two out of six chances. Okay, that's where this number came from. And then we can reduce that down so we're dealing with smaller numbers to keep things easy. So uh, by now you're probably very comfortable reducing fractions. Two divides evenly into both of those, two divides into two once, and two divides into six three times. And so there's our reduced ratio. Um, so there's a one in three chance that we're gonna roll a three or a four if we roll it just the one time on the number cube. Okay, one in three chance, great, okay. But they told me that I'm gonna roll that dice 150 times, 150 times. So that means I'm gonna have 150 outcomes, okay? So I'm going to use equivalent fractions. So if this three changes to 150, and this is what they, I'm gonna show you their way and I'm gonna show you the way I fall back to if it's not super obvious. Um, what do I do to a three to make it become 150, what do I multiply it by? And so we might notice, oh, three times five is 15, and then you've got the zero on the end, so times 50. Remember with equivalent fractions, whatever you do to your denominator, you must do to your numerator. So if we multiply by 50, in order to get to 150, in order to keep it equivalent, we must do the same to the numerator, one times 50 is 50. And so there's your answer. We have a 50 in 150 chances that when we roll out of those 150 times, it's gonna be a three or a four. So that's how you do those. Now, I'm gonna refresh your memory too, just in case, because sometimes we might not see real obvious what number do I multiply this by to be that, and so I'm just gonna give you my fallback, what I do uh, to calculate it when I don't notice it right away. It's pretty fast to do for me, so I'm just like, whatever, I don't see it right away, so let me just do this. Um, so I'm gonna back up, recall that these two fractions, one half is the same value as two fourths, right? If I have one half of a pizza, that is the same as if I cut a pizza into four pieces and ate two of them. It's no more, no less, they're equivalent. I can prove that they're equivalent if I multiply their crosses, two times two is four, and one times four is four. And that happens with all equivalent fractions. They're equal to each other. If you multiply their crosses, then they will have the same value. Now, that's useful because if I do not know uh, one of the three pieces, I can be the detective and solve it. Two times x equals one times four. And then I'm just doing inverse operations to isolate my variable. X is my variable, he's being multiplied by two. The inverse or opposite of that is divide by two. And I must keep that scale balanced to do that to both sides. Four divided by two is two. And we knew that, but I just wanted to refresh your memory on that. So I could use that same skill if I were looking at this one and it wasn't super obvious to me right off the bat, three times what gives me 150. I don't know, I'm not sure. So I could fall back to that knowledge and say, well, let me just do this, three X, three times X is three X, equals one times 150, which is 150. Now I'm just using inverse operations to isolate my variable X. Well, he's being multiplied by three, so I will divide by three, which is the opposite, or the inverse. And I do the same to both sides of the equation because I've got to keep that scale balanced. 
150 divided by 3 is going to be 50. So if it weren't super obvious right off the bat, like this one was, if it was different numbers that weren't as obvious, then you can fall back to using that skill and just multiply those crosses, solve for the variable. Okay. Let's look at another example like that. Let's say I'm flipping a fair coin 18 times. About how many times would we expect heads to appear? Well, let's just talk about a coin. Uh, how many times out of one flip would we expect heads to appear? There's only two possibilities. Oh, let's change colors there. Two possibilities, heads or tails, that something can show up. And out of those two possibilities, one of those possibilities is that it will show up as heads, right? But I'm not flipping it just one time. I'm flipping it 18 times. Okay, and I'm going to put the same thing over here just for practice purposes. Okay, it's an equivalent fraction, so, or an equivalent ratio. So, 2 times what is going to get me to 18? Right, 2 times 9 does. Okay, do the same to your numerator. So, 9 out of 18 times is your theoretical probability that heads will show up. All right, I did this one over here because I wanted just to take you through those steps one more time for that cross uh, multiplication if it hadn't been so obvious what number was multiplied there. So I'll multiply my crosses. 2 times x is 2x, and 1 times 18 is 18. x is my variable. I want to isolate my variable. I want him alone. He's hanging out with the multiply by 2. Do the opposite of multiply by 2 or the inverse of multiply by 2. And you must do the same to the opposite side of the equation to keep that scale balanced. 2 divided by 2 is 1. That leaves me that with 1x. 18 divided by 2 is 9. So it's a 9 out of 18 chance, just like this one. Two ways to do it. In case the multiplication going across there isn't as clear, then you can fall back to this to just solve it. Okay. I think you're okay on the quantitative part. Let's talk about the qualitative part. Okay, here we have Herschel. Remember, qualitative is really just the likelihood, really, is kind of what, what this is going for. So Herschel pulls a sock out of his drawer without looking and puts it on. Hopefully he smells it first to make sure it's clean. I don't know. That's what I do. Make sure it's, it's good. Herschel pulls a sock out of his drawer without looking and puts it on. The sock is black, so he's currently wearing a black sock. Let's draw Herschel real quick. All right, there's Herschel with his black sock. Oh, let's give him a little bit of hair. There we go. Okay, in the drawer, there's seven black socks, eight white socks, and five striped socks left in that drawer. He's going to pull out a second sock without looking. Is it likely that he will be wearing matching socks to school? All right, well, let's talk probability. How many possibilities are there total of what socks he could pull out? There's seven, eight, and five. So we're going to add those together. 7 plus 8 is 15, plus 5 is 20. There's 20 possibilities of socks he could pull out of there. Out of those, remember he's wearing a black sock. Out of those, oh, that's not black. Out of those, 7 of them are black. Okay, so he has a 7 in 20 chance of pulling a black sock out. Let's compare that to the opposite. So 7 in 20 chance of black sock so that he can match. People won't laugh at him and all that. Let's compare that to the opposite. So we're going to take, um, in the book they say they put the 1 there. All they mean by the 1 subtracting 7 is 20 out of 20 would be a 100% chance of something, right? Because there were 20 possibilities here. So in the book, just for clarification purposes, they have 1 and then they say um, minus 7 over 20, right? So we're just, we're just, I'm just converting that 1 to a 20 over 20. 20 divided by 20 is still 1, right? I just wanted to leave that as the, the chances. So 20 out of 20 chance that he's, um, that he's pulling a sock out. We, we know he's pulling a sock out, right? 100% chance. Okay. But um, we know that there's 7 out of 20 chance that it's a match. So what are the chances it's not going to be a match? Well, we just do that subtraction, right? So 20 minus 17 is 13. And so he has a 13 and 20 chance that it's not going to be a match. So we have 7 out of 20 that it's a match. 
to his black sock and a 13 out of 20 chance that it's not a match to his black sock. And so here's, here's what we run into. What are his chances? Uh, what is most likely to happen? What's most likely to happen? Is he most likely to get a match or is he most likely to not get a match? And so you just compare them. Well, he's most likely, 13 out of 20 is more than 7 out of 20. He's most likely not going to get a match. He's probably going to school without matching socks, right? So you just find out your probabilities of either way and then you compare those. What's the most likely outcome? That's what the qualitative one is. So he's probably going to school with matching socks or he's probably going to school without matching socks. I do that every day and I never, I never have matching socks. And most of the time they smell okay though. So that's good. Anyways, um, that's it. That's the only thing. So you just compare, you look at what's the probability this will happen. What's the probability it won't happen. And you compare the numbers, which one's greater. That's the, the likelihood of it happening. I think you're going to do fine on this. I think you got this. You got this. It is a high likelihood. You've got this. Go get it.